Hey everyone, this is Dr. Casey Johnson. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I know you're going to love today's episode with Katie Horwich. Katie is doing some amazing work, so I'm excited to have her on to share her story with you guys. If you've been loving the Unlock Wellness Podcast, be sure to jump onto iTunes, subscribe, and write a review. It really helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and support. Also, be sure to follow me on social media to keep up with the latest podcast episodes. The best way to connect with me is on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. My username across the board is at Dr. Casey Johnson. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. You can also check out my website at drcaseyjohnson.com. It has all of the past podcast episodes and more information about each guest under the Listen tab. While you're on my site, be sure to check out the Shop tab where you can check out my first book of my Healthy Children's Book series and learn about the Unlock Wellness Project, which supplies a wellness bag to a child in need for each book purchased. Thank you again for listening. I hope this episode leaves you feeling inspired to start making positive changes to your health. Now it's time for today's episode. I hope you love my conversation with Katie Horwich. Welcome to the Unlock Wellness Podcast. I'm Dr. Casey and excited for today's guest. I'm here with Katie Horwich. And Katie is a writer, speaker, and the founder of One, Women Against Negative Talk, a platform that gives women tools, insight, and inspiration to move forward in their lives by shifting their negative self-talk patterns. She has over a decade of experience in the wellness lifestyle editorial space and almost two decades in public speaking and performance. Katie is also host of the WantCast, the Women Against Negative Talk podcast, where she interviews so many inspiring people and is a podcast that is one of my personal favorites as well. So I'm extremely excited to have Katie on today to share her own personal wellness journey and all of the amazing work that she's doing. So Katie, thank you so much for taking time to come on. I'm excited to have you. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here and it's it's pouring in New York City right now. And I'm, sitting, I'm sitting on my couch in my sweats and this is like the best way to be spending the afternoon. I love it and happy election day. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I actually voted uh about a week and a half ago. Nice. Um cuz I did I did mail-in ballot, but I saved my sticker <laughs> voter to wear on actual election day. So I like it. I, I like it on the day. <laughs> I got there this morning, but that's cool that they gave you the sticker. I saw a lot of people on social media complaining that their mail-in didn't get a sticker. So, oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, we'll just kind of, uh, you know, jump into it, Katie, you know, first off where you're from and, um, what your own personal wellness looked like for you as a kid and not just physically, but overall mindset as well. So people really understand how you've evolved over time to where you are right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Where should we start? Loaded so, question, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like when we talk about wellness, I think this is probably a good place to start. When we talk about wellness, a lot of people have different definitions of what that means. Um, and some people want to talk strictly fitness, strictly nutrition, some people want to talk more like mind body. Some people, that's a question they just ask to, <laughs> for it to sound like a more specific question than mm -hmm. like, so tell me about yourself. So my question to you is when you define wellness, how do you define wellness? Um, yeah, no, that's an awesome question. And I, I honestly, <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> I um, honestly define it as all three of those things. I mean, mind, body, and spirit. I don't think I don't think you can separate them. Like, I don't think it's possible to, you know, mm -hmm. like you can't, you can't uh, separate physical from how you're eating to how you're thinking because they all affect each other so much. Totally. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I would definitely say that's how I see it. Like I can't compartmentalize them, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. So, I mean, you know, for you, was there one thing that was like off when you were younger or did you kind of just unbalanced in, in all of those places or, or what it did, did it look like for you? Yeah. Okay. So I am going to take this in a few different directions. Yeah. 
um, to sort of preface everything, growing up, I had a lot of self-confidence, but the lens that I viewed the self-confidence through was super scratched up, super blurry. I I had self-confidence, but it wasn't that I didn't know what to do with it. It's that the way that I viewed it was that it was almost a burden to the world or it was too much or the things that I that I saw other people were proud of of me it was like my my strengths were owned by other people and other entities besides myself I was not for myself I was for other people mm. so that combined with an intensely rich inner life um I like to say it's really loud in my brain which is why uh you know, if I'm in a social situation, I, I love people and I'm I'm very gregarious, but I actually spend a lot of time in silence for uh, most days and most days now, especially because a couple months ago I left my full time job to go full force with want. So I'm I'm not like sitting in an office anymore. And I like for the last I had something that was going on earlier in the day. And then the last hour or so, I was just sitting in my apartment, no music, no anything, and just banging out work and writing and things that were all coming from the busyness in my head. So combine that that whole storm and conversation that just won't stop in my head with that sort of, that knowledge that I had self-confidence, but I almost wasn't really allowed to have self-confidence. That was um, that was in direct conflict when I was a kid. And I, I always felt that, always, always, always felt that. I, I honestly can't remember a time when I didn't feel that way. And then as far as wellness, when it comes to my upbringing physically, that's sort of the mental, emotional stuff. So talking about the physical stuff, um, I grew up in a pretty health-minded household. I I don't want to say I was never an athletic kid. I actually really excelled at running when I was younger. And it's so funny to think back on now. I was invited to a track meet when I was in sixth grade to represent my school. But then there was a family function that was going on that day. And even though my parents were amazing and they fought for me to go to this track meet, just various things happened where it was like I, my parents and I were sort of like ordered to go to this thing. And and I I knew that it was I was doing it for my family, but I also was like, well, I don't know when there's going to be other track meets. And that was a really interesting, it could have been a turning point in my life because I was starting to get into acting and singing and performing during that time. And so a lot of people, when they talk about their like turning point as a kid, when it comes to, I, I'm also in the fitness industry, like when they got into fitness um, and what started their journey, usually it happens around that time. And then they become like a high school athlete or a college athlete, and then they get injured and then there's a whole story. And then they build a business around the injury, blah, 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 blah. Um, that wasn't the case for me. I didn't have that moment. And so I instead sort of wrote off that I was good at sports at all or, or athletic at all or an athlete. I remember an ex-boyfriend once calling me an athlete um, when I was in my early 20s. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's not an ad. Like, like I had gotten back into running at that point, which was amazing. Um, it, it took me almost 20 years to get back into running, but I did. But I was like running and I was like working out at the gym and it wasn't stuff that I associated with athletics because when I thought of an athlete and I thought of fitness um, or exercise, I thought of it as, or, or athlete rather, I thought of being an athlete as like doing a sport and competing. Right. And I didn't think of myself as athletic, even because when you're an athlete, you're athletic. When you're, when you work out, you're like maybe fit. You're equipped to do a workout at a gym. But I remember never, never 
associating myself with like, like physicality and working out, which is so crazy because then I came back to it way, way later in my life in a totally roundabout way. But I also grew up in, I was born in the eighties. So I was a kid in the nineties, which was like, I call it the snack wells generation. (laughs) So it was the point in time where everything was about being low calorie, low fat, this, that (laughs) people weren't talking about the benefits of fat. It was like fat was bad. Um, the lower the calorie, the better. And that chug was a, chug a slim fast, you know, totally slim yeah. fast snack. Wells, Jenny Craig, Pritikin, like that whole, the, the diet industry. I mean, it existed a lot like throughout most of the 20th century or at least the late 20th century. But I feel like the 80s and the 90s is really when it it started to become this whole other monster. Um, So I ended up going to college and I'm going to college for musical theater. And that was my plan was that I was going to be an actress and I was going to be on Broadway. And I, I feel very grateful that I was able to do a lot of professional work and I, I did get work. But what ended up happening is I... I I developed an eating disorder in college and part of that hearkening back to, you know, the snack wells generation. Um, I felt what, as a lot of people do when they have eating disorders, I felt like I didn't belong where I was. How people talk about college is how I felt about high school college. I just felt completely out of place. I felt like I was there to learn how to become a successful responsible adult woman in the world and the rest of the people that I were around. I mean, it was a bunch of 18 to 21 year olds, like being 18 to 21 year olds. Uh, So because I felt so out of control, because I felt like I was a proverbial fish out of water, I thought, well, what? And I was feeling uncomfortable in my body at that time as well, because I feel like that's a time where a lot of young women do feel uncomfortable in their body. And I had gained a little weight over the summer. So that made me feel like the physical uncomfort, discomfort matched the mental and emotional. So I was like, all right, so to be an adult, adults have control over their body and adults exercise and adults go on diets and have their food under control. And when I do that, then I will feel like I am an adult, I will feel like I've got my shit together. I'm allowed to say shit on this podcast, right? Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. All right, wonderful. <laughs> um, I, I'll have my shit together and I won't feel so out of place. So I started, I started doing what I had seen. Uh, wellness wasn't really a word that people used back then in two, early 2000s. Um, I did what people who were uh, living healthfully in that era that I had seen them do. And that was eating diets that had very little fat, that were very uh, huge air quotes, like very clean, not a lot of, um, and you know, clean even meant something different back then. Clean meant that it didn't have a ton of sugar. Clean meant that it wasn't doused in oils. It didn't matter if it was a frozen yogurt that was completely made out of Splenda. Like that counted because that was simple and it was low calories and you knew what it was and it didn't have the things that contributed to this thing that was unclean, which is a whole other tangent, which is just our culture's intense fat phobia and this, this fear of of fat and gaining weight. And it was just a weird, weird time. And I think that we're still coming out of it right now in 2018 and still feeling like the repercussions of that era. But anyway, so I ended up developing an eating disorder that's called orthorexia that is basically an unhealthy focus on health. Um, because after I lost the weight, it wasn't about losing more weight. It wasn't about how little I could eat. It was just that we're not taught how to maintain anything 
in our culture. We're taught how to achieve. We're taught how to strive. We're taught how to win the thing or get the man or get the girl. But then what happens after that? Like what happens after the goal? What happens after you achieve the success? We're not taught how to maintain. And that applies to food and our bodies and life. So I didn't know how to maintain. So I was like, I'm just going to do this thing that I deem as healthy because being healthy and following these rules is how you stay, you know, like a cool, calm, collected adult. And this is the path to success. And to veer from it is to be an immature child. And plus you're in show business and like that doesn't help because you have the pressures of that, of auditions, of other people around you that you're constantly comparing yourself with like that alone, but plus the other social, um, you know, things as well. Like both of those combined, that's just uh, kind of a recipe for disaster though. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, freaking going to ballet class every morning at 8 AM, which by the way, I woke up three hours earlier than that to go to the gym because I was like going to ballet isn't a, isn't a, a decent enough workout. And so I'm going to work out before. And I've heard that like productive and successful people work out for an hour at the beginning of the day. So going to ballet class every single morning at 8 AM, putting on a leotard and having to stare at yourself in the mirror. And I, I was, the way that my body is made up is when I was re- really little, um, I was very swayed back. So like my butt stuck out a lot, basically, basically what all of the Instagram models are doing right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I just stuck with that. Your time. I, I would be super insta <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, but no, that's just how my body was made with a, with a big curve in my lower spine. Mm-hmm. And I remember my grandmother, my grandmother modeled when she was little. I remember her taking me into a dressing room and making me stand with my back against a wall and her saying, I shouldn't be able to put my entire arm between the wall and your back. So, and she, she didn't mean anything. She was doing the best that she could. And she wanted, she wanted me to stand up straight and be a lady and, you know, she like, she thought I was so beautiful, which was another thing that was great, but it's like also like beauty for other people, which goes back right. to what I said at the very beginning. Um, but from a very young age, I was, I was very conscious of manipulating my body and, and fixing things and not like working out X amount or not eating whatever, but tuck your tailbone so that your butt doesn't stick out. Um, suck in your stomach so it's not sticking out over your jeans. Like I was, I was so conscious of the body manipulation and ballet. For anybody who's listening, who's ever taken a ballet class, ballet is all about subtly manipulating your body. It's about the turnout. It's about the the specific curve in your spine and the way that your neck is, and it's about creating very specific and precise postures. So going into a room where I already have like that history behind me and being in skin tight clothing and looking at my body and thinking about where it should be in space at any one point in time and then trying to manipulate it and and my body would hurt because it wasn't supposed to be, it wasn't made in certain in a certain way. And now I know after studying fitness, not in school, but after school, but Mm -hmm. being in the fitness industry, um, doing a lot of yoga, having a lot of yoga, not just yoga teacher friends, but a lot of yoga teacher friends who are also teacher trainers and also talk about like functional mobility. All of our hip joints, for example, are completely different. And the way that you stand and the way that you're able to do certain poses, say in yoga, is going to depend on literally how your ball and socket joint looks in your body, which is a a skeletal thing. 
But with ballet, like they don't really give two shits about that. You need to look a certain (laughs) way. So there was that part and that's without even stepping into an audition room. And when it came to the audition rooms, it was actually never about for me comparing the way that I looked to other people. It was that the way that I felt and the way that I looked were in complete contrast. So I remember my my teachers, when you're in school for musical theater, they talk a lot about um, your type and typecasting. And because I was in my 20s and because I have a m- higher-ish voice, um, and I could also sing really high, I, I could sing those soprano ranges. And also, P.S., because I had lost a lot of weight and I didn't know how to maintain, so I just like kept losing it, I was pigeonholed into the ingenue type, which is basically like the wide-eyed, um, like Maria in West Side Story, or uh, like usually usually the female lead in like Meg Ryan's character in You've Got Mail. That's the right. ingenue. They're like the bright-eyed, fresh, youthful character. And I would walk into the auditions and I was like, I want to like belt out these big brassy songs and I have this rich inner world where I feel things and I feel things really deeply and it it can be a really dark place in there. I I didn't look like the way that I felt on the inside. And so therefore auditioning for me when it came to musical theater, at least became a really unpleasant experience because it, it was all about going in and basically faking this part of my personality um, or, on the other hand, trying to prove myself to a room of people that I'm not just what you're looking at. I'm not just what I look like. So it just became like some people get into acting because they love being a different person. I loved acting because it made me feel the most me possible. and that was something that was really, really hard for me. Again, I was really lucky that I did start to get work. I was in LA, so mostly like TV and film and commercials Mm -hmm. when I did start to work professionally. But I started to realize, and especially um, leaving college, I I spent my senior year commuting back and forth because I was going to finish school, but I was getting work. But I also knew at the time, because orthorexia wasn't something that people were talking about, I found one website that was talking about it. And I was like, well, if no one's going to talk about this and people are just going to call me crazy, but this is literally affecting my, it's affecting my voice. It's affecting my instrument that I, that I need to do the job that I want to do out in the world. Um, I was like, if no one's going to actually give me tools to help me, I, I mean, thank God for that rich inner life because that's what saved me. I need to get myself out of this triggering scenario that's holding me back and pushing me into an existence that I don't want to be in. So I loved my professors. I loved my classes. But just like the whole college thing wasn't really me. And so that's when I removed myself from that situation. That's when I actually started to see process or progress. And that was also around the time that I started to go to group fitness classes regularly and find community. Because I was like, I just need to get back into my body. I loved music. It was musical theater. So music was like my love language. So I wanted to get into... I, I, I get back into my body. And a way to do that was with music. And so being in group fitness classes got me moving my body. It got me getting lost in music. And it was also great because I was surrounded by other people. So there was like this vague, low key accountability, Mm -hmm. but also vague, like not vague, low key um, camaraderie and community and this like unspoken support in the room. And I would, I would see all different types of ages, all different bodies, all different backgrounds and everybody coming together to have an experience together was just, it was so powerful. And so I ended up getting certified to teach 
uh, spinning, indoor cycling. And I started to teach and through teaching and through taking classes, I listened intensely to the way that instructors would speak and the way that people would speak to themselves. And at that same time, that's when going back to like being my own guinea pig for my own recovery, I was doing the same out in my life. I was listening to how people spoke to each other, about each other, but also about themselves. And it wasn't that I I realized at that moment that negative talk and ne- negative self-talk and bonding over negativity, it wasn't that I, I realized it existed at that point, but I think that's when I realized how prevalent it was in our society and how much it influenced our day-to-day actions. And that's when I really realized that the language that we speak to ourselves about ourselves, both in our head and out loud, also is reflected in the way that we speak to each other. Because it's all the same language, you know? Like, you can't just be speaking Spanish in your head and English completely solo out loud or English in your head and and Spanish out loud. Right. You know, like if you're, if you're learning a a language, you've got to do both. You have to internalize the language and you need to practice it out on others and you can't get fluent by just doing one of them. Yeah. And and that's why I I really love what you're doing because I think for a lot of people, they just aren't aware of, of what they're doing or how they're talking to themselves. You know, I think that it's becoming a more popular topic now and like, you know, platforms like yours has really helped so many people because of that. It's just, you know, we have like these limiting beliefs and like these stories yeah. we tell ourselves day in and day out when we say it so many times that first, we don't realize we're doing it. And second, we say it so many times that we believe it's true. And it's, yeah. it's insane. Like, you know, I was thinking about this this morning before, uh, you know, just getting ready for a call. And it's, um, you know, just, I mean, for me personally, like I was thinking back on, little things like elementary school, right? Mm -hmm. People would like say like I was shy because I was more like I would be more quiet and I wouldn't go out of my way to be like the center of attention. You know, you can can come off. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, people would be like, oh, she's shy. And I, I, I realized how far I carried that along with me when just by really digging deeper into it, it's like, I'm really, I'm not shy. I just have to have time to process things and I have to have that alone time. And I don't have to be the first to respond, but I'm not shy. But I mean, I could see how people could take things like that and super negative things too. People could take along with them on that ride too. And it's just insane how much those limiting beliefs and those stories can just stay with you for, I mean, from elementary school till, I mean, like nineties, hundreds forever, because it's like, it, it just, they don't go away if you don't address totally. them. Yeah. And like, that's when you're learning the language, right? Like that's when your brain is just in a constant state of development. It's funny you mentioned the shy thing. I remember a distinct moment when I first started to do um, gr- like community theater. Mm-hmm. I did community theater when I was in elementary school, um, going into middle school, but it was a uh, an organization that like I found through my cousin did a production with them. Like I knew someone peripherally through her. There was something familiar there. And then I remember in eighth grade, that community theater group uh, sort of fell apart. And so I was looking for another place to go, or my mom was looking for another place for me to go. And she found this group and the very first day of rehearsal was basically a like, a get to know you like icebreaker day right. and the parents of the kids were invited and like any friend, it was basically an open house, um, but directed at the people who were actually signed up. And I remember that one of my best friends went with me and my mom and they both sat on the side and I did the thing. And after we left and then we dropped my friend off and my mom said, um, I don't know if she said that she was proud of me, but she definitely said, I mean, I'm sure she did in her way. Uh, <laughs> but what I, what I, what I remember from that experience was that she said that my friend had turned to her and said, I would have never expected this from Katie. I like, she was so 
she put herself out there so much. Like I would have expected it from this friend or this friend who we all have mutual friends. Um, but I would have never expected for her to be the one who would do that. And it's like, I might not be the leader of the pack right out of the gate. I mean, still, I, I, I sort of use the like, like take a beat and then respond, like take in information, process information, and then sort of pepper yourself into a scenario. Like that's my strategy in new social situations. Um, especially if they're going to be like longstanding social situations, like a new job or a new organization. Like I learn as much as I can about the existing dynamics that I'm coming into. And then I sort of start to work my way into that. I'm still that way. uh, But, or, and rather not, but when it's game time, it's game time. Like I am, it's not fake at all. It's just like, I know when to give it and I know when I need to reel it in and not for anybody else, but myself. Absolutely. No, I mean, that's, that's huge. And and like, I I just think it's amazing how you're addressing that. And and obviously through all of those experiences that you've had, it's really given you that experience to help a lot of people. And so on that journey, like when did you kind of have that spark that of creating one and like how how did that even come about like I mean it's such a big thing that you're doing when did that first like spark happen yeah so that (laughs) happened twice by the way (laughs) seven years apart um which is a great lesson also I'm sorry there's I don't know if you're hearing like ambulances in your ear. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> no big deal. It is. It's crazy out there. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> two times seven years apart, which I think is very valuable information for people who are who are purpose driven and service driven and mission driven. That just because something comes around to you the first time, and you don't necessarily have the tools, or it doesn't come to fruition doesn't mean that it's a bad idea. It just maybe means that it wasn't time for it yet for various reasons. So my story with want is that this was 2007. Um, It was actually during my senior year of college. So I was living at home. I was, I was working. I had just finished up a contract with a regional theater group in Southern California. It was like my first, my first like big union role. And so like career and everything, it was going on the track that I wanted it to go on. I was in this practice of just fiercely listening and I wasn't completely through my eating disorder, but I was on a really good path and proactive path of recovery. And I was away with my family and we were uh, we were in Hawaii and it was my dad's, oh my gosh, it's going to be, yeah, it'll be the 11 year anniversary. Um, like this Thanksgiving. That's so we we're, cool. yeah, <laughs> super, super cool. Uh, so we were in Hawaii for my dad's 50th birthday. My, <clears throat> my parents and my brother were downstairs. I was upstairs taking a nap and I woke up from the nap and I turned on the TV and this commercial came on. It was the very first commercial for the Dove Real Real Beauty, Dove Real Bodies campaign, which was now that that now iconic image of all of the women in their in white underwear and and tops, and they were all different ages, all different races, all different body types. And the message around the commercial was basically love, love yourself. You're beautiful just as you are. And I saw that and I had three thoughts at the same time. It just like hit me. The first thought was, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I mean, really it was the first like major media body positive campaign. It was revolutionary at the time. Now it's, I mean, it's really cool. We see stuff like that very, very commonly. But that was, imagine if you'd never seen anything like that before. And I imagine what it was like when 
on the Mary, uh, the Dick Van Dyke show, uh, Mary Tyler Moore started wearing pants or like <laughs> Catherine Hepburn wore pants in the movies. Like seeing that and being like, Oh my gosh, like you're allowed to do that. That right. it was huge. So that was my first thought. Like, Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Second thought was, well, what happens when I'm not feeling beautiful? What happens when I don't feel like I love myself just the way I am? Like where, where are the steps to get me there? And then the third thought was I'm going to start a platform that gives women steps to shift around their negative self-talk patterns. And I'm going to call it want women against negative talk. Like the, so that, all the name, to- the name came to you. Oh, first the, thing. the concept, the name, the acronym, like it was just, it was just like one of those flashbulb moments. I think I wrote it down on like a, a, a napkin or a piece of hotel stationery or something. And I ran downstairs and told my parents and they were like, this is so great. This is so cool. And I I got a semblance of a business plan in motion. My business plan was basically make a website and sell shirts, um, which is not a business plan, by the way, when you want to start something that I was calling at the time an awareness campaign, because that, that phrase sounded super sexy to me. And I was like, well, it's not just a website and it's not like, I didn't know what to call it. So that, that stuck out to me. Um, and I emailed all of, all of my friends, all my family, everybody was flipping out over this idea. And it, after like a year, it just started to fizzle. And it wasn't because of anything that anyone did or said that momentum was always there, but I didn't capitalize on it at all. And now when I look back on it, I know that a, I didn't have the the technical tools behind me. I hadn't learned how to create a business plan. I hadn't learned how to create structure to an idea. I hadn't. I didn't know what scaling was. Like I had just gone through an eating disorder. I thought that scaling scaling was like the thing that you st- was stepping on a thing and then like writing down your weight after. Like scale. I didn't know what that meant when it came to to right. a, a business or a brand or whatever. Plus, it's 2007. I mean, and if you're, how much do we really know about building online platforms yet? Oh, you know? like it's just crazy. Nothing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I knew how to. I actually had built a couple websites via like Angel Fire or GeoCities. At the time. Angel Fire. I forgot <laughs> about Angel Fire. That's hilarious. Uh, oh, I didn't. Um, fun fact when I was 13, I started, I was a very, I was an early adopter of like message boards and online friends. However, it wasn't around anything except for the musical Les Miserables. Uh, (laughs) I was 12 or 13 years old and I would join these Les Mis message boards that followed the touring company of Les Mis at the time (laughs) um, that was going around the United States and like talking about the actors and talking about the different sets and the, the performances and Basically, I was being like a 42-year-old <laughs> theater, theater connoisseur in a 13-year-old's body online, Absolutely. all online. So I actually <laughs> made some like lame is, uh, lame is fan sites for some of the actors. <laughs> so embarrassing, but also so That's endearing amazing. to my little self. Um, so I had experience building websites, but like a website is a website. What What's behind that? Um, there's now we know things like SEO wasn't something that people knew about back then. Um, right. And now it's, you know, search engines were like just becoming a thing. Like Ask Jeeves, I think, was still the biggest. Ask Jeeves, <laughs> yep. So this was like, I had the idea before I was really technically able to do anything with it. And then moreover, I had thought of the idea that I so desperately needed at the time. And because I needed it, I was not equipped with the tools to help impart lessons to other people and help other people work through their struggles. Like basically at the time, if I had started writing a lot of things, it would be like me, you know, faking a role or it would be me I just, I felt really uncomfortable at that point. Like I I didn't talk about my eating disorder or body issues with anybody. I didn't talk about what I, 
all these things that were going on in my brain. Like I didn't talk about any of the, the things that I was experiencing out loud. And I felt a lot of shame and confusion around them. So when Watt came back around to me in 2014, it was after I had passed that point of like, okay, I, I am through my recovery. I mean, in some ways I feel like people who have been through eating or body related disorders, those triggers are always there. It's very much like, like an addiction. Um, like those choices are always there to make. You just have built up the tools and the power to not make those decisions time and time and time and time and time again. So right. I, I say that I'm recovered, but and I, until I can find a better word, I will find a better word at some point. But um, anyway, when I found when I found want again, or when it found me rather, I was at that recovered point where I I was talking about things that I had experienced and um, talking about it from a, a a perspective where I could attach emotion to it. Um, but I wasn't attached to that emotion, if that makes sense. Like I could, I, I think that that's something that is a skill that is unique to, to writers and to actors to a point. But when you're sitting down and you're writing something, good writing has a very strong emotional attachment to it. And good writing is also, um, is, is also storytelling. And it's about the, greater like mission and ethos of the piece that you're writing. It's not about venting. It's not about just like getting things out. Like that's what like diary writing can be great writing, but that's also like there's power in putting your emotions on a page to just get it out. Um, my friend Katie Dalebout does a lot of really good work around journaling and processing emotions through journaling. But through building up a career as as a writer and as an editor, I learned how to tap into those emotions and find the gold in those emotions without actually exploiting those emotions and myself with them. That was the point in which I could make want a thing. And I was watching a Brene Brown video on YouTube one night. Oh, and <laughs> uh, Yeah. It was yeah. like the one that everybody's seen that put her on the map about vulnerability. Right. And at that point I was uh, an editor at an online wellness magazine and I was happy, but I felt like I needed to be, I was supposed to be doing more. And when want came back around to me, it was when I was watching that video and it just like the first time I was like, I actually think that it was a, a Brene Brown video and it was a Marie Forleo video that I found like researching, like how to do something. I don't know. And then I found Brene Brown. So the combination of Marie Forleo and Brene Brown, I was like, Oh my gosh, want, want is the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. And not only do I have all of the technical skills to be able to do that now because I've been doing this now as a career for five years, six years, whatever. Um, I also was really both confident in what I knew and confident in what I didn't know. So there was no faking involved. If I didn't know, if I wasn't sure about something, then I wasn't going to portray it as something that I was sure of. If I wanted to have a conversation around things that didn't involve my expertise, I would reach out and talk to other people who had that expertise. But I was also very conscious of, because when I, I looked, because I knew how to do a business plan at that time, and I was looking at like um, like uh, brand identity and uh, and competition, basically. So I was looking at different things that were going on, like doing market research. And I looked and I realized that most people who are talking about self-talk were talking about it either as like a supporting example to a greater thesis or like a side note, um, or they were talking about it specifically just related to your body and body image. And I was like, how has it been 
seven years, and there's still not a platform that is entirely dedicated to specifically self-talk, but also broadly self-talk, the umbrella of self-talk. Because when we're talking about self-talk having to do with our bodies, a lot of times, like, yes, it can do with our bodies, but a lot of times it doesn't have to do with our bodies. We're using our bodies as a scapegoat for something else. So I was like, why does this not exist? And the things that I was finding that did exist, they were very clinical and they were very much like written in, in a way that was so academic that you had to be in academia to like kind of understand it. And I was like, no, I've been doing this work now through my own self work, but also I've been teaching fitness now for, um, that was around the time that I got certified too, by the way, back in 2017 or 2007, when I first thought of it, I, I literally thought of it. And like three weeks later, I, I had a, I had already had a certification in the book for like end of December. So I had been teaching classes. So that was like the best focus group ever because you get people who are, you get 60 people in a room who are in a completely vulnerable state. And so you get to read the energy in the room. You get to hear after and before what they're going through. You get to speak to them in a certain way. And then you get to see how over time, what you've said to them in their most vulnerable moments when you're like really getting to them, how that's affected them. So I've had those test groups and I've also just been so committed to shifting the way that we treat ourselves so that we can actually move forward in our lives and be the person we know that we're meant to be. I'd been doing that for long enough that I was like, I'm coming at this as a writer, I'm coming at this as a speaker. I'm coming at this as someone who is a real life professional. And I I had a lot of imposter syndrome around the fact that like, I wasn't a psychologist for a while. I feel like that's normal though. Like I I feel like once you dive in and then especially if there's positive feedback and you're having a lot of successes with other people, I, I mean, I could see how that would, easily happen and would be at like a norm. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing about imposter syndrome is that the people who actually probably should have imposter syndrome never have it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's always the people who are on to something and who are doubting themselves. It's like that upper limit problem that, that, that people talk about and that's mentioned in books where it's like you hit a ceiling and you're ready to be bigger and brighter and greater, but then you start to doubt your professionalism, doubt your worth, whatever, so that you don't hit that upper limit so that you're just like pushed down and pushed down and pushed down. So yeah, I had a lot of, a lot of beef around like not being a psychologist, not going to school for neuroscience or whatever. But then I thought about the people who I connected with most and who had changed my life the most. And when I thought of those people whether they were people who were actually in in my life, my physical life, or people like um, like a like a an Oprah, for example, right. like like Oprah is not a psychologist. Like she might have taken a few courses, but <laughs> Oprah has has that thing and and has that that it's been gifted with that awareness and that ability to dig really deep and, and find the gold. And I, I, PS, I am in no way comparing myself to Oprah, but, but you, but you do no but you do an amazing job at that though. At no, thank deeper, you. Though. Thank yeah. you. I like, I well I, and I think the point being so many of the people who make an impact in our lives and who we sort of put on these pedestals as like, I want that type of career. I want that type of life. Like, a lot of them didn't get it because that was the thing that they first decided that they were going to do. Some people, of course, like I think that um, like Britney Spears, Jennifer Lopez, a lot of artists, like that's something that people know from a young age and they are just relentless in their determination and their drive. And they've got that that chip in them that just keeps going no matter what. And I admire that so much. 
But for a lot of other people, there have been twists and turns in life. It's sort of like what Glennon, Glennon Doyle says. Um, if you want to find out what your true what your true purpose is and what you are meant to do on this work and on in on this earth, find what makes your heart hurt. What makes your heart hurt? And that will tell you where you're supposed to go. And a lot of us, like that's that's where we find the gold. That's where we find our mission. That's where we find what I call your through line, which is the common theme in everything you love and the common goal in everything you do. That's where that through line can come into really good use. So once I let that like BS story of I'm not legit because I'm not, I don't have like some sort of science degree. Once I let that go, then I fully leaned into what I could bring to the space that I hadn't seen before and that I knew that people needed. Right. I I think that's amazing. And I, I love how you mentioned earlier just on the point of just because something isn't ready at that point doesn't mean that it's not a good idea and, and having the resilience to keep pushing through or maybe even being okay with a goal changing. Because I think people also get kind of married to different goals too. It's like if one goal doesn't work out, they're afraid to change it or they have to stick with one certain thing forever. And I think like um, a good example too, I'll kind of like give your one of your episodes a shout out as well. Yeah. Uh, you had, uh, you had um, Ashley Piper on. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I, oh man, she's great. But she's like, but it, it was her, their book, right? Like she put it out there in the world and it was just not the right time. And yeah. it would have been so easy like to give up on what she was doing, but coming back to it, however many, was it, I don't know if it was years. I can't remember the exact time. Frame. Yeah, it was like, it was like a year later and it was actually her agent who said to her, Hey, I think that this is like, let's revisit this. It's time again. And she was like, no, I've been burned. I'm, I'm so scarred from this experience. And she was like, you know what? Like, let's work it. Let's work at a different angle. And so taking that, that lesson also, I mean, I, I love her story around that because that's also a great example of having an idea that was a super strong idea just there were certain things that weren't in place yet in her, in in her life at that at that moment there wasn't the stuff that was going on in the world <laughs> right so there wasn't like that fire she comes from a political strategy background also so like she has that fire in her naturally but there wasn't this completely like gobsmacking overwhelming uh, like urgency in the culture where it was like, okay, this is what we need. Right. So I, I actually think that she, that's always, I've known her for gosh, since I was at my editorial jobs, I've known her for like five or six years now. And she's always been, she's always been super whip smart, but also been like, she's she was an early adopter of like we need to do things right now to change the world and like our form of activism can be as small as learning how to compost like change the way you live your life and you're going to change the the social and political and cultural sphere so i think that was always in her um but I think that something something happened after the election and after that period of time where it was like, oh, no, that's like, that's your bread and butter right there. Right. Is that what you're talking about is actually going to move the needle, which is where I feel like I'm at right now as well. And I feel like I've been there for the last year or so now 2017 was sort of like an intensely personal year for me because that was the year I got married and then 2018 was getting back into the swing of things and I feel like at a certain point I I don't want to say that I was wooed or like starry-eyed over like the way that self-talk fit into the wellness 
sphere because I still firmly believe it it 10,000% does and because the way that you talk to yourself is the way that you treat yourself and the way that you treat yourself is the way that you live your life um but now I'm also like oh the way that we talk to ourselves inside is how we're going to freaking change the world on the outside. So I've got that like that fire under me now that's sort of like, okay, this is game time and this is go time. And I, I am, I'm really pumped for 2019 because I'm, I think that I'm ready to be, uh, ballsier or lady ballsier (laughs) than I've been in, in a while. And I think that I am really fired up about how, what, how I can play my part in this whole, just like social and cultural dynamic that we're living out right now and how we can actually like proactively change it and how we can live in a an environment and in a a country and in a culture that is inclusive and that is kind and that does pay people equally and that doesn't, you know, suppress voices and suppress voters. Like that all starts with the way that we talk to ourselves because the way that we treat others is a direct reflection on how we treat ourselves and vice versa. Like I always say that one of the best ways that you can practice positive or as I say, like more proactive self-talk is give compliments to people. We live in a world where we don't give compliments as as freely and often as we should in a genuine genuine, yeah in a genuine in a genuine jinx uh genuine and specific (laughs) way and Sometimes when we give a compliment, we we give it expecting something back. So giving it genu- generously and genuinely and specifically, that's going to make us more genuine and generous and specific with ourselves because it's all the same language. It's all just about becoming fluent in the language you actually want to become fluent in. No, I, I love that. I 100% agree. Yeah, it's just... Like you said, it's just being genuine with it is one of the most important things or, you know, kind of to go back on on something you were, you were talking about on your finale podcast, which was great, by the way. Oh, thank you. you. Yeah, it was, I I loved it. No, but um, you were talking about how we frequently ask how people are, but we do it in a way that not we're not trying to be mean but a lot of people really we're, we're saying it in like a robotic way we don't really care or we're not taking the time to actually listen and respond and i think that that's huge and mm-hmm. it's i mean i think it's something that everybody needs to be more aware of and myself included because i mean how many times do we talk to the person at the store but we're not we're texting at the same time and we don't really care like i think if you can apply that in just a lot more situations um, it's crazy how many people you can connect with and it's a lot more fulfilling and that obviously affects every other aspect of your life. Totally. Totally. I mean, the overuse of the word fine also, to, <laughs> to be like, how are you doing? Fine or good. Yeah. I, I, it's like, we ask people how they are just, you know, because that's the thing that we should say. And we say fine because we, some in some way kind of know that people are asking because of you know that's the thing that we should say right my husband once said to me he when when it was early in our relationship and I would ask like how his day was and he would say fine I was like no but like (laughs) how was your day and he was like, it was, it was fine. He's like, there's like a lot of details and like, you don't need to know all the details. And I went, no, but actually I do. And I want to know the details and I want to know how you're feeling about your day. Not just like the objective things, but like, how are you feeling during your day? So I know where to meet you at. And that was a game changer. And that also changed how I ask people how they're doing. And 
that is also, I've got to credit my husband. He's just an awesome human being, which is <laughs> why I married him. Shout um, out to Katie. Spoiler alert. <laughs> he, uh, Jeremy is pretty awesome, but he, I think he asked me maybe once and then I like ran with it. He was like, how are you doing physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, physically this, mentally this, emotionally this. Or I'll ask people who have like maybe been going through a hard time. I'm like, how's your heart doing? And not like, how's your heart? Like, okay, it's it's like resting heart rate of, of, <laughs> of, of 70, whatever. Right. Um, but like if someone's just gone through a hard time and it may have taken a toll on them emotionally, like how is your heart doing is... I feel a way more thoughtful question than how are you doing? Not just from the asking perspective, because you're asking something again, more specific and more genuine, but it's also doing the person that you're asking a favor because you're basically saying to them, I want you to share the emotional stuff with me and I'm here for it. You know, right. it gives a permission because I think a lot of people, they just don't want to like burden you with the negative stuff. Because I mean, if somebody asked me how I was doing and maybe I'm having a rough day, my initial thing isn't like unload that on them. You know? Totally, like, totally. Have. There's this idea that like we're constantly being a burden to other people, which is such a bummer way to like view yourself. Maybe. It is. It is. And I, and I think through resources like yourself, I think you're making it more, you're, you're opening up the conversation to make it more doable and to make it more common. I, I think it's just, like you said, it's just, we don't want to be a burden, but at the same time, you have to have those conversations. Otherwise you're going to end up in a bad mental space. And so that's obviously something that we're seeing a lot of, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty awful. Yeah. But you know what? We have the power to, we do have the power to change that. And the way that we act is going to inform the way that people react and the way that people react informs another reaction. And it's just like, it's a huge domino effect. It's like, it's, it's on, it's like my husband saying to me, like, how are you how are you doing mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually? I now ask that of other people. And I now have friends who will ask that back to me or I'll see like on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Um, I'll see them comment on another friend's post and be like, like, uh, how's your heart today? Oh my gosh. Like I, <laughs> I thought them how to say that. And, awesome. and then, and they took it and now it's theirs. And, and maybe they'll find a spin on that, that, that works. That's a little bit different, but also works for them. Like it's silly to think that our voice doesn't make a difference when it makes all the difference in the way that we live out our personal life. hundred you know? percent. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And yeah. And, and as far as once and everything that you're working on, the blog, the podcast, what is coming up for the future? I, is there is there a book in store? Can we be looking for? Girl! I, I, have, I'm, I have a feeling you're going to say yes. <laughs> yes. Um, that was part of the, I'm just going to freaking say it. That was, that was part of the reason that I, I had to push the call till later today is that there was a, a really important um a really important meeting that I had to be a part of that could only go on at that point in time. I'll allow it then. And I was like, ah! <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, well, in turn, I will tell her about it on her. Perfect. Transparent. So yeah, I mean, and I, I've been up front with people. I'm right now I am shopping for the shopping for, I'm, I'm, looking for the perfect fit as far or the best fit possible as far as agent, as far as editing, as far as publishing, all of that stuff. Um, and I'm now I'm being really upfront with people and saying like, look, this, this book can live in like the self-help and self-improvement area for sure. And I, I think that it probably will. However, this is, this is my also my form of revolution. And this is, this is my form of activism right now. And I am 
being upfront with that, kind of just like how I was when I was, when I was, I don't even want to say dating because I was on, I was on the <laughs> online platform for less than 24 hours. And then I found my now husband. So I like that works I skipped over. Yeah. I, I like the efficiency. Oh, I hated <laughs> dating so much. So basically I was like, I am going to put everything out there and I'm going to be completely myself and I'm going to write everything that I'm, I actually am and actually thinking like, I'm not going to play some stupid game. And if a person, because basically if, if, if I'm going to be with the person, I'm, I've always been a relationship person. I've never just been like a casual dating person. So if I'm going to find someone who I'm going to have longevity with, like they're going to find this stuff out about me anyway. So I want them to know right out off the bat. So this has the best chance possible at succeeding. Um, and it worked with my husband. So I'm kind of like that now when it comes to honestly with, with everything, with the book, with, um, with some different stuff that's happening in 2019, as far as events that I'm looking to do and speaking engagements that I'm, that I'm looking to book. Um, cause I am actively booking for the beginning of the year now, which is awesome. Um, but I am so committed to doing the thing that I, I say at the end of every podcast, which is I, I say, be the you, you know, you're meant to be, which is very different than be the person you want to be. Because I believe that we all know deep down who it is we're supposed to be and what our strengths are. But there's just so much noise in the world that tells us starting at a very young age and convinces yeah. us to be otherwise and want to be otherwise. But do we really want to do that. And that goes back to like, like, do you want to be other people or do you want yourself? Do you want yourself just as you are? Do you want to be the best version of the best you that you can be? And so right now I am committed to being the me that I know I am and the me that I know I should be out in the world world. Um, and Whatever comes from that, I'm cool with because I will know that I left everything on the floor and I gave it my all and it was all mine. And if something doesn't work out, then I'm like, okay, well, that actually wasn't a fit or that actually wasn't supposed to happen. Not to say it's not going to sting because things really hurt when they don't happen. And right. not to say that I'm not going to be sad about things, but. I would so much rather be sad and then have that information because everything is information, right? So I'd much rather have that information moving forward and be like, okay, awesome. Not my people or not my person or not my thing. What about that worked and what about it didn't? And what can I take with me into the next scenario as myself? Um, like that's all great information to have. If you're trying to always be what you think you want to be or you think other people want you to be, then you're just going to be in a constant state of manipulation. And I am, I am done. I'm done with that. The only manipulating that I am doing is, I don't know, in, in yoga class when I'm <laughs> hitting a new pose. Because <laughs> right. I mean, you really have come full circle with that because that's basically what you said has been your entire life, whether it was as a kid with your grandma or in ballet class, it was always trying to fit somebody else's mold or adapt to the thoughts of what they wanted you to be. And it's kind of come full circle to where you realize it's obviously not about that and uh, trying to teach other people that as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I, I love that. I love that. So the yeah. book, so the meeting, the meeting went well. Yeah. Yeah. It went really well. I mean, it's, it's still like, this is all very beginning stages, but I also feel like, I don't know, I'm, I'm having the conversations right now, which I think is maybe a valuable lesson for your listeners. Um, cause I think that sometimes we protect, we either protect information and we don't say anything to anyone or we like overshare and it's not uh, whatever the thing is either isn't ours anymore 
or we've like all of a sudden lost steam over it because everybody else's expectations are attached to it. So I've started to talk about it now when the conversation is on either a podcast or it's a conversation with people who have written a book and we're talking about like process, advice, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about it a lot with the people who are actually the closest to me in my life um, because they're almost too emotionally invested in me and my success, which is amazing. And I'm so lucky to have. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing that or saying that that's a bad thing. However, that also prevents me from actually doing what I know is right. And my judgment then gets clouded for who I am. It gets clouded with their, their opinions and their investment in the project. So it's like, I'm talking about it right now because I know it's something that's going to happen. And I can talk, I know the people that I can really talk about it with where it's like, like, I know that I just, I know we just met on this call, but I feel like I can talk to you and I'm like, yeah, this is happening. And you're like, cool. Awesome. Rad. Like keep me posted. Um, (laughs) I, I, I know those people. And then there are also people who are going to claim a little bit of, of, protectiveness over me and of that and my experience with that. And that's something that, that I'm not ready for yet at this stage in the game. Like it's something that I really need to do on my own. And I also realized like, if I'm not talking about it right now, and this is a, this process is going to be a prime example of like putting all of my work since 2007, right? <laughs> really good use. Like, if I'm not talking about how I'm navigating this situation, then I'm doing a disservice to people who are who are also wanting to go for big things. I think that there is power in listening to somebody's journey. However, I think that. It can also be dangerous if the person is still trying to figure out which way is up mentally and emotionally and still processing like their place and everything. Sort of like when I first thought of want, like I wasn't ready to share stuff yet because it would have just been me venting and it wouldn't have created the proactive minded community that I wanted to so create within want and out in the world. But this is a very objective process that has very subjective opinions laced into the process. And that I'm totally cool talking about. I'm sure that there will be some things that happen that I will keep private until after they happen. And I'm sure that there are things that are going to happen that I won't really know how to emotionally navigate in the moment that I will share for later. Um, but this is actually kind of a cool test for me to be like, all right, let's put everything to work and let's see how you can enter into a situation that could get very emotional and that could get very unknown. And with all of this good, like talk in the talk that you've done, Let's see how you actually walk the walk. I, I'm really interested to see how this all pans out. Again, it's like there's obviously an outcome I want, but everything is just like, I don't know. It's a cool story that's unfolding. I'm really excited to see what happens next. That's awesome. No, I'm, I'm excited for you. And I, I mean, just based on the work that you've already put out into the world and the pot, like just everything's amazing. So I don't doubt that what you put out there is going to be amazing. And I have a spot for your book and Talia's book that's coming out ready on my bookshelf. You guys. Just oh have my to- gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm really part of the reason I'm, I'm excited to have a book out in the world is that I'm really excited to connect with other authors and like Atalia, like uh, my friend 
Jessica Mernan, who has an amazing cookbook called One Part Plant and who's a, a, an amazing advocate in the women's health space right now. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Danielle, who founded a platform on Instagram called I Am I Am Her, I Am Her Tribe. And she just came out with a book of poetry called I Am Her Tribe. Like we're all very different in the way that we write, but we've all got similar sensibilities and we all want to create change in a specific way. Um, I'm really excited to join forces with people and be like, yeah, like let's do this together. And my message is going to resonate with some people. Talia's message is going to resonate with some people. Both of our messages are going to resonate with some people. Like we're just more powerful when we work together to create what we want to create, when we, when we work together to support a greater mission. I'm really Definitely. excited for that. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible. I, I love it. And besides the amazing book that you're going to put out there, what is there anything, <laughs> uh, anything happening in the future for the blog and the podcast? I know the podcast has a little break, right? It's yeah, just, yeah. Other, but other things going on with yeah. uh, platforms as well. Um, so the podcast is on a little hiatus right now. I am going to be running like best of episodes until the new year. And then when the season starts back up, I'm going to be doing an episode every single week, which I'm super pumped about. It's a really long time coming. Um, and it's going to be a 20 episode season. Definitely going to have more listener Q and a episodes, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, I just, just signed on with Aptive, which is an online and audio fitness app. So I'm teaching classes for them. Um, so there are, and they are like ridiculously next level supportive of want and, and want to work together. And so I'm really excited. We've talked about some collaborations already, um, just around the, you know, around the new year, around shifting your self-talk in the new year, changing your mindset instead of like going to changing your body first. Uh, really excited for those for those activations. And then as far as the site goes, I am now finally um, bringing contributors into the site, awesome. which is super exciting. And I I have always wanted to do that, but I wanted to make sure that the brand voice was really locked in and super strong before I did it. So I also had some contributors come in at the end of this year who I know and I, I love their writing. I love their voice. Um, and it's stuff that I can sort of point to people to be like, here's what works. So there is a page on the site that is a, a contribute page. It does have a pretty built out like what kind of content works on what want, what kind of content falls flat, but it's sort of the same thing of like putting everything out there. So there's no guesswork. Um, so I'm really, really, really excited to have other people's voices on the site talking about amazing, unique, specific, vulnerable, deep, sincere experiences. Um, and if anybody who's listening is like, yes, I want to contribute to this site and to this platform that's all about shifting your negative self-talk, go to womenagainstnegativetalk.com slash contribute. And all of the guidelines are on there. And then at the very end, it tells how you can submit. Perfect. Now I'll put that in the show notes. That way people can go check that out. And what is the best way for people to follow you on social media? That way they can keep up with everything that you're doing. You're always putting a lot of really great content out there. So what is the best way for people to follow you? Wonderful question. So you can always find me on Instagram. I'm at Katie Horwich. It's H-O-R-W-I-T-C-H. It'll pop up as Katie Joy Horwich uh, want. Um, so I'm there on Instagram. Want also has its own Instagram page. It's at women against negative talk. I just revamped the newsletter back in, I believe it was August or September. It's now monthly. It's super built out. You get it at the top of every single month. We call that newsletter, the good word. Um, you can subscribe to that. And that link is on the site on the homepage. If you just click on the good word. So that newsletter is, I want it to be like, 
like a good newsletter. I didn't want it to be like a half-assed newsletter. Right. And I started to half-ass it and I was like, nope, got to use the full ass. So, <laughs> so I- like the monthly, that, that's cool though. How, yeah. how has that been going for you? Um, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I, I'm seeing a slight difference in like the click rate and the open rate, which is awesome. And in addition, I know it's the right decision because I'm excited about it every month. I feel energized by it instead of depleted by it. And sending it out feels like I'm actually offering value to people instead of just sending out because it's like, okay, well, if you don't find if you don't find the want content on Instagram or on Facebook or going directly to the site, like here it is from the week. I just felt like I wasn't spamming people, but we all have so many emails coming in right. and we subscribe to newsletters and unsubscribe. Like I wanted this to be something of substance and I, I'm really, really proud of the way that it's turned out. And so that is a, a fantastic way to stay in touch with me also. And I, I share personal stuff in there. I share products I'm loving. I share links that I'm loving. I shared one about the evolution of Britney Spears in the last newsletter. <laughs> um, it, just like this epic article I found that I was like, yeah, people are going to love this. Love um, it. uh, it, it's, it's really fantastic. And then also if you go to Facebook, um, it's Women Against Negative Talk, and in 2019, we're going to be starting a private, closed, want Facebook community, Facebook page, um, because a request that I've been getting from people for a while now is, like, I love the conversations that, that you're having on the podcast. I, I feel like I'm talking to a friend. I love the things that we talk about on want. I, I want so much more of this in my life. And like, these are the types of people that I want to connect with. And I'm hearing this from a bunch of people. So instead of just like randomly introducing people via email and being like, you guys should know each other. I'm like, you know what? Let's put together a Facebook page. Let's put together a community. We can talk about all of the stuff that is going on. There's are going to be like built out guidelines around that just so uh, so that we can sort of protect it from being just like a public, like venting sesh. Right. Um, so keeping it proactive, keeping it pragmatically positive. So not just positive for the sake of being positive. Um, so yeah, 2019 is going to be baller. I'm super pumped. That's that's awesome. I'm excited for you. And I think the group's going to be huge. Like we were talking earlier, just that sense of community is so important. I, I love that. And that is that coming out like just January? Yeah, I think that I'm going to launch it along with the season four of the podcast. Cool. Awesome. No, that's amazing. Now I'll put all of that in the show notes. And then once the uh, community launches, I'll share that as well, just so people know it's good to go. And yeah, and Katie, just closing question that I ask yes. every guest. Yes, yes, yes. But if you just had one piece of advice for the audience, maybe it's something that's been your biggest takeaway through your own wellness journey so far, but if you just had one piece of advice to give, what would it be? Mm. Can I give two on the You can give two. I'll let you have two. (laughs) Okay. The first one, the first one doesn't really, I mean, it counts, but I already said it. So my first piece of advice is be the you, you know, you're meant to be. Um, Because like I said, that's very different than saying, be the you, you want to be. Um, there, there's, there's power in, in knowing who you are and what you're meant to do. And then, and even if you don't know what you're meant to do, like, like having a sense, even a feeling of who you are and then acting on that. And then the second thing I would say is be proactive, not reactive. A lot of times we will do things as a reaction to something else, um, it's a defense mechanism or it's to shield ourselves from hurt. Being proactive is, I say it at the end of every podcast, moving forward fearlessly through something. I love it. No, that's perfect, Katie. And I for real love all of the work that you're doing. I'm excited for people that haven't checked out your your content yet to go do that. Like I said, all the things will be in the show notes. That way you guys can go get click and give her an ad. But Katie, just thank you so much for taking time to come on. I loved having you. You're amazing and can't wait to see all of the great work that you do. So thank you. Thank you. This was awesome.
Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you loved my conversation with Katie. She's doing so much positive work, so be sure to give her a follow on social media to keep up with everything that she's been working on. You can find her social media links that we talked about in the episode in the show notes, but you can also find them on my website as well at drcaseyjohnson.com. That's D-R-K-A-S-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O-N.com. Click on the Listen tab. Then from there, you'll be able to see all of the past guests that have come on the Unlock Wellness podcast, read a little bit about each guest, and be able to click on their social media links, websites, all of that. So all of Katie's information can be found on my site as well. If you guys loved today's episode with Katie, be sure to jump onto iTunes, subscribe, and write a review. It really helps me out a lot, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and support. Thank you guys so much again for tuning into today's episode. I hope you loved it. I hope it inspires you. And most importantly, I hope you take action. Whoa!